you there. Welcome to Geopolitics and Conflict Show. Elizabeth and I have a very special presentation for you today. It, you might call it a labor of love. It is a labor of love. So today, uh, you know, we've been talking about doing basically a breakdown of the hypnotic patterns, the patterns that politicians and um, and and their staff and are using basically to manipulate you. And one of the biggest things that we're going to discuss is the uh, the speeches that politicians make. Politicians, when they make speeches, they're speechwriters. These are very well paid individuals. These are people who know what they're doing and they understand how the human mind works. But the thing is, the rest of us, or not us specifically, because we know this very well, but the rest of the population doesn't really understand how the human mind works. So it's really easy to get sucked in. It's really easy to get manipulated by what's being said or what you're seeing. So we're going to break that down today with Joe Biden's Build Back Better Infrastructure speech. This one is loaded. So we're going to go through two small segments and show you exactly what's happening in them. Our goal is to give you the tools that we have so that you can come out of the hypnotic state that they've put you into and actually understand what they're saying and what they're doing. Our goal mm -hmm. always is for you to have enough information for you to make up your own mind, not be manipulated by hypnotic patterning of these really skilled speechwriters. They are. They're very skilled. And and so <clears throat> let's let's dive in. Uh, first of all, follow me on Twitter. And David also is on Twitter. I'm at Alchemy of E and David is at D Wallaloo. We love interacting with you guys. We love talking to you. I've had conversations with a bunch of you guys on Twitter and it's really, really fun. Also, uh, if you want us to do this with somebody else's speech or even an interview, we can dive into body language. We can dive into, you know, you can tell from someone's eyes, you can tell from the flush of their skin. So there's all kinds of things in this realm that we can dive into. So if you're interested in us doing it for a specific politician or public figure, put that in the comments below. We're going to do these a lot more frequently. So this is our first one. We're sort of seeing how this goes, but uh, let's dive into it. So we're going to start out with, there we go. There he is. All right. We are going to start out with the very beginning of this speech. Before we dive into the speech, I want to talk about something called pacing and leading, or it's also called agreeing and leading. So pacing and leading or agreeing and leading is where somebody uh, understands your worldview. They understand your worldview and they make it seem like they understand what you're going through. And that's called the pace. And then they take where you are at, your particular worldview, they go all the way through it and then change it to what they want you to feel their worldview is. All right, so let's watch and I'll stop it a bunch and we'll talk about what this is. There it is. That doesn't look like there. That looks like President That's Biden. Him. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for sharing this day with us. Why this day matters to you and our fellow, your fellow iron workers and your families, and you explained it well. For all the okay, so I'd like to talk about that for a second because your fellow iron workers, your fellow iron workers, as some is a, a very foundational American type of blue collar worker. And when you're talking about the particular uh, segment of the population that's not necessarily a huge fan of Joe Biden here, uh, it's that. It's the, the sort of average standard American. This is a president who has one of the lowest approval ratings in history. So who is he going to speak to? The average American or somebody who's perceived as the most average American possible. Folks at home, I know this day matters to you as well. I know you're tired of the bickering in Washington, frustrated by the negativity. Okay, now we're going into the pacing or agreeing. Yes. Are people really fed up with the government? Yes. Yes. So we can, and it's you know, it's almost universal. So here we are, we're agreeing, he's pacing our experience, and he's starting the hypnotic expression of agree, agree, agree. Okay. 
he's using here something called uh, an accusation audit. An accusation audit is when somebody says all of the things you're thinking in the back of your mind all of the negative things that you could possibly accuse somebody of, if you speak to it at the beginning, and if you address that without them having brought it up, it releases a lot of that anger because you've acknowledged the, the sort of unspoken that's there. So that's called an accusation audit. And there's another thing that he's doing here, and it's called tactical empathy. And tactical empathy is when you understand and can empathize with the other party uh, without necessarily telling them they're right or agreeing with them. So listen for that. And you just want us to use and focus on your needs, your concerns, and the conversations are taking place at your kitchen table. Conversation. All right. You want to address the conversations that are coming up at your kitchen table? Well, one of the things he's he's continuing to agree or or right. pace the people, and if you listen to this, you say, "This guy, this guy knows mm -hmm. this because these are the things we're concerned about. These are the things that we are talking about. And where do we do it? The kitchen table. He must really understand us. Yes. Now we're going to watch to how does he put a tail on this to start to manipulate us further. Um. Okay. So th I. I want to talk a little bit about uh, identifying and vocalizing what everyone is thinking, because when you identify and vocalize it, you know, people really like other people who are like them. And, you know, you can say, oh, that's terrible or, oh, that's not great, but it's how we are as people. And what's ha what happens with covert or tactical empathy is that the person who's speaking it is trying to make themselves like you. When they make themselves like you, the things that they say go in a lot easier because you can say, oh, that person's like me. I understand them. We are afraid of things that we don't understand as human beings. And we also uh, we also like things that we can understand. And, it, and something to keep in mind here is if the speaker gets it correct in terms of what your experience is, you can no longer tell who's talking. Yes. Is it? Am I talking to myself? Therefore, it's really going to go in easily. Or is it somebody else? The right. closer they get to how you're thinking, the more influence they're going to have over you when they do the next piece. Absolutely. And so that's why this is a very important part of the pace. As profound as they are ordinary. How do I find work? How do I get there? Okay, this is an extremely interesting thing that comes up over and over and over again in this speech. And that is, how do I find work? Now, you may or may not know this, but here in the United States, we are in the largest labor shortage that we have, I think, ever had. Not job shortage, labor shortage. That means there are many, many more jobs. I think it's at the peak, it was at maybe 11 million more jobs than we have people to fill them. So why is this being brought up? Because nothing in a speech like this is on accident. Everything is brought up for a particular reason. So why is this being brought up? There are a couple of reasons. And I think the biggest one is something called a temporal distortion. So it's trying to bring people back to a time when jobs were a problem, which was for a large portion of history and a large portion of recent history. Now, a lot of a lot of people long for 2019, right? The time when things were before all of this pandemic and people want things to go back to normal. So you can distort the time people thinks that it people think that it is from right now all the way back into the past by using an anchor or something that people remember from the past all right let's keep going how can our small business thrive and our child succeed in school or how do we boy you talk about universal <laughs> un universal touch everybody how can our business survive mm -hmm. yeah well we are if you're running a business, you're concerned about that. Yes. So it's a wonderful pace. And how can I how can I get my child to be successful? First of all, we got to go, oh, child. Mm -hmm. Okay, now they're starting to manipulate our emotional states because 
we care about our children, but we're not human. Right. <laughs> um, when we talk about hypnotic language, I want to I want to give a definition for that. So there are a lot of definitions for hypnosis. There's the type of hypnosis where, you know, you're sitting in an office and you're being hypnotized by a therapist and hypnosis can be extremely valuable. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. It's sort of neutral in its own right. The hypnosis that I'm talking about or that we're talking about as a definition here is anything that bypasses your critical thinking. And emotions bypass your critical <clears throat> thinking. It's it's just think think of a time when you maybe had like a fight with with a family member, for example. You know the family member that like really pushes your buttons. How did you react? Did you react logically, or did you bypass your logic and react emotionally? So emotions bypass critical thinking. So the the amount of small businesses that have been shut down due to everything that's happened in the last two years, the government's response to the pandemic, small businesses are still suffering. Many have been shut down. And so that is, that's very emotional. The other thing is anytime a politician mentions a child. So anytime anyone mentions a child, it is, uh, it is a deep emotional connection. However, the way the human mind works, and you can also speak to this, the way the human mind works is like a giant file cabinet of your memories. You have memories of everything you've ever come in, in contact with. So when somebody says a word like child, what happens is your mind goes all the way back into your file cabinet and picks out the memory of a child that is most relevant, that it thinks is most relevant to the situation. So when a word is used like child, you go into the file cabinet and this all happens unconsciously. You're not doing it consciously. Your mind goes into the file cabinet, picks out this memory that says this child and this memory might be of your grandchild, of your child, of your niece and nephew, of, of your best friend, of you as a child, whatever your mind thinks is most relevant. And that's what it puts into the sentence to have it make sense. If you can't, you can't make sense of something some, someone else mm -hmm. is saying without going to that file cabinet. Absolutely. So child, yeah, you are going to do a deep dive into what a child is based on your memory and experiences of children. Right. And you, you think of a suffering child. Oh, now you've been clearly manipulated into because everyone's seen a suffering child. Everyone has seen a suffering child and a lot of us have been suffering children. So that's uh, so so that's sort of the background of any time, you, because when, when a politician or, or, or a political figure says child or that it's for the children, you can kind of feel it sometimes. You can kind of feel like maybe they're not being the most genuine ever. And who would be against taking care of children? Of course. Clear, clear hypnotic manipulation. Absolutely. Emerge in this pandemic, not just a little bit of breathing room, but with real fighting chance get ahead when we ran for president get ahead you talk about a generalization mm -hmm. now what is a generalization it's a it's a general statement kind it's an abstraction with no real definition behind it mm -hmm. and so if you're going to say well to get ahead now you have to go back to your file cabinet again and pull up what what get ahead means but notice he's not spe he doesn't specify it in any way. Right. So it's a generalization with no content. Right. And getting ahead is is something it's a very common term. Everyone wants to get ahead. So there's a familiarity in this language, which we'll see a little bit yeah. later when we dive into the next portion of this speech. There's a familiarity in language. And the more familiar language is to you, the easier it is to actually go into your mind and not be, uh, you know, our, our minds have blocks that block out things that uh, that are that are jarring to us, that are not uh, comfortable to us. Our minds have blocks. They, it's like a natural guard. And it's not a bad thing. It's necessary to exist in this world. So uh, so anytime you see language that's really common language like that, it's intended to bypass uh, to bypass your critical faculty 
and lead you to a particular um, it, belief. And so when you when you listen to this, you say, well, my special definition of get ahead. Right. Now, who's going to oppose them getting ahead by their right. own special definition? Exactly. But they're not universal definitions. They are not. Your version of getting ahead is different than my version is different than his version. And so that goes back to the file cabinet of you put your own meaning in when he says get ahead. And that's done on purpose. All right, let's keep going. To help, I thought maybe I could help answer some of those questions for you. And uh, I want to point out something that is not necessarily hypno hypnotic, but... Um, Joe Biden stumbles a lot. Even Raman agrees. Joe Biden stumbles a lot on his words and he's reading off a teleprompter. So the fact that he's stumbling on his words, that's something to take note of. This is not the first time he's read off a teleprompter. He has read off a teleprompter many, many, many times in his life. So it's just something to take note of. And he does it a lot. And the needs you have. Because every time I'd ride home on Amtrak, I'd go through just north of, of uh, just south of Baltimore and look out. He did it again in that case. Uh, but now we're going to go into the story portion. When someone tells a personal story, you feel like you are there with them. You feel like they understand you. You feel like they are like you. So this is a really important part of the pace is him telling a personal story about how he is just like us. He's riding the Amtrak like a normal average American. Let me say something about stories and human beings. Yes. We are in the, the stories we tell ourselves are how we define ourselves. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we are story creatures. How many stories have you heard? It's the best way to learn something is through yep. a story. Absolutely. And before writing occurred, all history, all dynamics, all things were told through story, parents, the teacher, answer, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we are we are bound by our brains for storytelling. Yeah. And we relate to them better than almost anything. Right. Well, and it's one of the best ways to get someone to actually pay attention or to learn a lesson is through stories. So uh I'm, that's that's what we do as human beings all day, every day, even if we're telling the story of what our friend did last night. Storytelling, I've, I've done hypnosis for 30 years and storytelling is the finest way to get someone into a trance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's listen to his story for a second. Go through a suburban neighborhood. I look in those, all those lights are on in the windows. And it's, I look and I wonder, what are they talking about? I'm serious. Swear to God. What are they talking? All right. So he is on his Amtrak. He's on he's on the train and he's looking out at you. And even look at his body language. He starts looking out at the people. He starts looking out at you. You are the person who is sitting in that suburban house with those lights on, with Joe Biden riding by in his train, wondering what you are thinking. You have to ask yourself when he says, and swear to God. Yes. What is he really saying with that? So, <laughs> okay. So swear to God, that's, uh, so he doesn't just say swear to God. He said, I think he says it's the truth or something like that. I swear it's to God. Truth, I swear to God. All right, here it is. I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay. I'm serious. I swear to God. So if you didn't have a reason to doubt whether that was true or not, the fact that he just said, I'm serious. I swear to God is a reason to question that. So not only does he use one qualifier, he says, I'm serious. I swear to God. It, it is not when somebody says I'm serious or I'm honest, it isn't a guarantee that they're lying. It's not. Sometimes people say, um, I, I'm, 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 I swear, or I'm telling the truth or honestly, and they are telling the truth. However, when you add two in a row to something that, I mean, I don't know that anybody would have necessarily questioned this. It tells you that he questions whether he's believable or not. Yes. So he questions whether, whether people believe him. 
And that should be enough to get you to start thinking in the direction of, is this, is this a real story? If he doesn't believe that people believe that he rode a train through a town mm -hmm. and wondered what they were thinking in the window, that's a, that's a fairly simple, you know, normal thing for people to do. So, so look at, look at patterns like that when, and you can tell that he doesn't quite, he doesn't, he, he can't quite tell whether people are believing him or not. So you should definitely question that. What are they talking about sitting at that table? What are they talking about? They're talking about the things that I talked about at our kitchen table, Julie. All right. What are they talking about at their kitchen table? Now he's going to show he really does care. Yes. Again, what is that? It's agreeing and leading. Yes. So it's his rapport building. It's, I really understand your perspective. Uh, I know that you're sitting talking about all these important issues, whether they are or not. Yeah. That's another story. Right. But he's attempting to really connect. And again, another great hypnotic pattern. Let's talk about rapport for a second, because uh, rapport is a really great word um, for what's happening here. Uh, <clears throat> rapport is when you connect with another person. And what he's doing here is building up that rapport, building up that connection with us. Now, um, he goes into talking about the kitchen table. What could be more fundamentally human than sitting and having a meal together with your family? And this is one of the most powerful men in the world, Argu arguably arguably easily one of the most powerful men in the entire world. And if one of the most powerful men in the entire world does the exact same thing that you do, that makes him one of us. And really, quite frankly, I don't know that he is one of us, but he's making it seem like he is through this language. There's all of you as well. Ask about how can we come together? I want to, I want to go back for one second. Um, me at my table, Jill at hers and all of you. Okay. This is priming. So when, especially in threes, and you see this in his speech a couple of times where things come in threes, me at my table, Jill at hers and you at yours. So the first two things they're, they're believable, right? So we're going to go into something called a presupposition and a presupposition is when you have something that's verifiably true. So it's verifiably true. Another, the next thing is verifiably true. And so your mind is primed to believe the third thing. So in this case, it's not necessarily that it's verifiably true, but it's that this is similar to me. This is similar to me. It must be like me. This is a, when ling linguistically, when you break down an important sales call, what you want is, yes, I agree, the customer saying, yes. yes, I agree, yes, I agree. Now you're very much predisposed to buy something, like whatever he's going to say next. It's this head nodding phenomenon. Mm -hmm. To be president for all Americans, to make sure our democracy delivers for you, for all of you. And I promise that we couldn't just build back to what it was before. Okay. Here's where we get the lead. So remember, pacing and leading is when somebody understands your worldview. They get it. They get your worldview. They get where you're at. And then using that connection, that rapport that's been built up with you, they lead you into the worldview that they want you to believe. So he's built up this huge case for what you're going through, the problems that you're going through, how hard it's been and how he's just like you. He's in it with you. He's even he's even in the city with you riding the train. He's even at your table he's in your even kitchen, at your kitchen with table. his wife. And so now he's going to lead you into the solution, the worldview that is the solution to all of these problems and all the problems that you're facing. And that is build back better. His solution his solution, because it's his worldview that he wants to bring you into. All right, I'm going to go back a couple of seconds so that you can really hear this transition into Build Back Better. All Americans, to make sure our democracy delivers for you, for all of you. You. And I promise that we couldn't just build back to what it was before. We literally had to build back better. You couldn't build back 
We're the only country that's always come out of. Okay. You literally couldn't build back to the way it was before. You got to build back better. That is the linguistic solution to all of the problems that were just built up. And boy, is it hard to resist build back better. Whoever dreamed that up would really did a nice job. Whoever build dreamed that up, I, it, it's very impressive. So build back better is an alliteration, right? And it, it just rolls off your tongue. It's kind of fun to say. I hate to admit it, but it's <laughs> it's kind of fun to say build back better. And <clears throat> and that was that was crafted. That was crafted. Well very crafted. Well. And you see all of these programs, they all got these catchy names. It's easy to remember. It goes in easily. And who doesn't want to build back better? You don't want what you had before. You want to build it back better. Whoever came up with that, seriously, they must be paying, get, getting paid the big bucks. Because yeah. that one's they, that's they, very, not, they should be they should come be. up with something that smart. That's very impressive. Great crises stronger than my one end. The world has changed. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. We literally had to build back better. You couldn't build back. We're the only country that's always come out of great crises stronger than when one end. Okay. <laughs> um, that is verifiably not true. That is clearly distortion, mm -hmm. which is another linguistic distinction. It's not supported by any factual information. Yes. And it is an interpretation that's meant to actually deceive you. Yeah. The world has changed. Boy. Okay, remember the threes. So so keep this in mind as you watch. The world has changed. There's going to be one more, and then there's going to be the thing that he is leading you to. Remember the presupposition. The world has changed is verifiably true. You can verify that in your mind. If you look around everything that's happened, the world has changed. So it is priming your mind to agree with this third thing that he's about to say. We have to be ready. Fellow, we have to be ready is verifiably true also. America today, I want you to know we hear you and we see you. There's the third. And there's the third. We hear you and we see verifiable, you. Verifiable, verifiable, not verifiable at all. Right. But you're now nodding your head. Mm -hmm. So you should, well, I sort of want to believe him. Yeah, yes. right. Okay. That's the first part of this. So the next part, I'm going to go check on, check on you guys for a second. Hi, everybody. I see you in the chat. I can't read all of your chats, but I see you guys. And thank you for being here with us. This is our first one of these. Uh, if you're here with us, put in the comments who you'd like to see us do this with. Um, you know, give us a give us either like the title or a, a link to a video. Whoever you'd like to see us do this with, we are absolutely open. So as put you it said in the before, comments. as we said before, this is a labor of love. This is something we spent decades at. At least one of us has. I've and spent decades at it too. I, although I am young, I'm a little bit older, I think, than you guys think I am. But, <laughs> uh, but I too have spent decades doing this. Okay, so the second segment, the second segment is very interesting, and it's where. So this is full of this kind of stuff, but you ultimately get how jam packed every single word and line is in a speech like this. Everything that's done here is done on purpose. And there's something called cognitive overload. And cognitive overload is when you are given so much of this type of language that your mind can't filter anymore and you go into a hypnotic trance. Because how many of you really understood just how much was going on? I think that was like a minute or two minutes. Two and a half minutes. And we already gave you a, a large number of distinctions, linguistic distinctions. And it was every line. Yeah. Every single line <clears throat> was was something. And so when your mind gets so overloaded, it says, I give up. And it just sort of lets a lot of this stuff in, which, which is intentional also. Okay, so this next portion, let's see, where are you at? Seven minutes. This next portion, he talks about what's actually in Build Back Better. And remember, this is a huge infrastructure bill. It's huge. There's so much in this that what he pulls out <clears throat> is very specific. All right. So my message 
to the American people is this. America is moving again, and your life is going to change for the better. Okay, let's go back to the presupposition. America is moving again. That is verifiably true. Absolutely verifiably true. Does that mean your world is going to change? This is cause and effect. The world is moving again. Therefore? Therefore, your world is going to change. But is it actually? Is it actually going to change for the better? We don't, <laughs> we we don't, don't know. know. And for, for a lot of people, I think probably the answer is no. If you live in one of the top, if you live in one of the 10 million homes, or you're a child who attends one of the 400,000 schools for child care. Okay. So he's about to talk about lead pipes. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of context here. So uh, if you're, if in, you're in one of the 10 million homes or 400,000 schools, there is a brilliant book called lying with statistics. And if you have been paying attention for the last two years, I mean, I, I think everyone on the planet understands how statistics can be manipulated. Now, 10 million or 400,000 seems like a huge number. That's a lot. That's a lot of people that are affected by what he's about to talk about, which is lead pipes. Now, you have to look at that in the context of how many homes are there, but he's not giving you context. And he's no, he's, not he's also not giving you a percentage so what percentage of american homes have lead pipes so if it's 10 million i think there's 140 million homes in the united states that makes it i'm not great at math okay so five to seven percent of homes have this problem okay well so if he said if we're gonna go we're gonna go in and fix the five percent of american homes that have this lead pipe problem is that as compelling as saying 10 million? No. So we have massive deletion of context. We don't have any frame to put this yeah. into to figure out what does this mean? How big of a problem is it? What's the real impact here on our people? We don't know because we don't. The, mm -hmm. the frame is not there. It's been deleted. Right. Right. And like I said, one in four children in the United States doesn't have food to eat when they go home. Is that a bigger problem than the 5%, 7%? You guys put it in the chat, whatever it is, but a very small percentage of American homes that have this lead pipe problem. The next part. So we'll, we'll, I'll let you get through this whole. You face a clear and present danger to your child's health and your health now. Okay. Oh no, boy, clear and Fair present, present danger. danger. That was a movie. <laughs> it was a scary movie too. I watched it, well, 20 years ago. So we have this, and it, it's such an, a roll of words to say clear and present danger. Boom, it's going to hit my adrenal glands. I'm going to have a spike in adrenaline. I'm going to feel fear. And, oh, we have to do something. Right. Now, what's the answer? Right. Okay, so a couple of other things about this. So what he's chosen here is lead pipes. Lead pipes are not uh, controversial. They're bad. It's not something that, that, that anybody is going to have a red flag that says, oh, I disagree with this. No, lead pipes are bad. Lead pipes, children with lead paint, lead pipes mm -hmm. develop autism. Oh, there's not uh, well, a question about there's it. Not a it's danger. Right. It's hugely dangerous. So what he begins with is something that is not arguable, right? It's a low impact into you because you already likely agree with it. How many of you guys agree that lead pipes are really bad for you? You don't want to be drinking water with lead in it. So the first thing that he brings up out of this massive bill is something that no one's really going to argue with. Right. And you're using children again. Remember, children. Oh, it hurts children, my heart to have a child suffer. Right. Anytime children in schools are being harmed, that's a, and that's a legitimate problem. But anytime, remember, a child is being used, it is meant to tap into your emotions and bypass your critical thinking. And uh, he's using lead pipes and, and lead in your water, which is something that is very, very low uh, resistance rates to coming into your mind because it's a generally accepted 
bad thing. Well, now that you told me this lead pipe problem, please give me a solution. Right. And it's enough. 10 million homes is enough for the average person who frankly doesn't know whether they have lead pipes in their home or not to ask the question for themselves. So remember, any anytime that you can ask a question for yourself, anytime that somebody poses a question and then you go in internally and say, well, wait, do I have that problem? That makes you... Uh, that makes you very susceptible to believing whatever it is that they present as the solution. This law is going to start to replace 100% of the nation's lead pipes and service lines. Okay, it's going to start to replace. Notice it didn't say it's going to completely replace. Right. So if we do one household, we've started. We've started. That's an interesting linguistic technique also because he could have said we're going to replace 100%. But that's not what he said. That's not what's written there. What's written there is that they're going to start to replace these things. So every American, every child can turn on the faucet and drink clean water. Okay. We're talking about universal quantifier. Universal quantifier. Every, every, everybody. every. Yeah, good luck with that. Well, um, well, based on, based on uh, they're going to start to replace it. <laughs> I don't know how long that's going to take. But the universal quantifier, it includes you. So when you hear every, your internal system says, everyone, that includes me. People have a necessity to belong. Belonging is honestly fundamental. Maybe the one of the most fundamental up there with food, water, shelter is belonging. And we right now are in a time where most people have a very hard time understanding where we belong or if we belong to a particular country, a lot of people don't necessarily agree with what that country stands for or what the government stands for. And so people have a very, very strong need for belonging. And so universal quantifiers speak to that internal need inside of someone speaking to the need of needing to belong. And so here you can belong to all Americans and having clean water to drink is uh, is obviously something that is a very low, um, low resistance rate. All right, we're going to we're going to go through one more really quick because I don't know how long this has been, but I think it's been a while. Thirty seven. Yes. Thirty seven minutes. We are we're going to do one more. Thousands of plumbers and pipe fitters. Oh, we got to do that one. OK. Yes. All right. I'm going to go back a hair so you guys can listen to this. Turn out the faucet and drink clean water. Tens of thousands of plumbers and pipe fitters are going to get work done. Good paying job. Folks. Oh, let's talk about this one. Clearly, it's distortion. It's lack of context. Mm -hmm. Because the context is they're already, according to the National Association of Home Builders in 2021, there's already a 55% shortage of plumbers available to work. So right. we're going to tens of thousands of them are going to go do this work. Where are they going to get them? And so somebody hasn't done their research or it's clear manipulation again for yeah. jobs, jobs. Are, boy, and everyone wants, wants everyone else to be working. Right. It's just we want good things for other people like a job. Right. Well, talk to me about a labor shortage. Right. So if we're so. So it goes back to this isn't addressing something that's an actual problem. And again, it's a context problem. So it, it and and this is, goes back to the job thing that he talks about all the time during this is that he's going to create more jobs, high paying jobs, well paying jobs. Well, you know, there's a 55 percent labor shortage in in particularly in plumbers. Right. There's not the people to fill those jobs. But because you are conditioned to think that more jobs is better, and this has been conditioning that's been happening uh, as long as I've been alive and right. probably much longer than that, where there is there is the scarcity. You want to fill the scarcity, which is a fundamental human need. We need, and in areas where we're scarce, areas where there's loss, we need to fill those to feel better, to feel okay. And so because you're you're basically been primed to understand that more jobs is better, the understanding that right now we're in a huge labor shortage 
and that we don't need more jobs. We need more people to fill those jobs. He can't, or he isn't speaking to that. And my, this is my theory, but my theory about this is that people wouldn't respond as well because people don't have that same mindset for there's a labor shortage as they have for more jobs is better. So this is using the cognitive priming that's been happening for decades. There's also the piece of not enough, not enough jobs. Let's scare everybody some more, even yeah. though it's a total non-reality. Right. Um, fear is one of the best ways to bypass someone's critical thinking. And we've watched it a lot. We've watched it a lot over the last two years, but it was happening before that. You know, one bad thing in, in the human mind, one negative thing could be the end of your life, right? So there is a much heavier relation put on the importance of negative inputs to positive inputs. And I think, I think the number is like, it's seven times, I think it's actually more than that, seven the, times more. Neuro research says seven times. Mm -hmm. If it's negative, it has seven times the impact of something positive. Right. So what's utilized to draw people in? It's the negative stuff. And so fear is probably the most um, powerful motivator. And so it's used all the time. And right now people are feared to, up to the hilt. And when you're in a state, um, it's very hard to get out of that state. And your mind sorts for ways to keep you in that same emotional state. So people keep finding and keep being fed, quite frankly, fear over and over and over again. But because you've already been afraid for so long, it's easier for you to stay in the fear state than it is to get out of that fear state. Okay. Uh, we are really happy. Thank you guys all for being with us. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this. And our goal was to give you some very specific tools so you could observe mm -hmm. public speakers, your friends and family, even yourself, and know what's actually happening and how you're being manipulated and how you can become free of that manipulation. We hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, check us out. We, we're going to have a Q&A with Ross and David tomorrow. It's just for you guys. We know that we can't answer all of your questions um, w during the Friday live streams. So we're just, just for you guys, we're going to do a Q&A uh, Wednesday at 11. Um, there is a members only Q&A and it's, it's over Zoom. I mean, we just, we talk to you guys, we hang out and it's on our membership at geopoliticsinconflict.com. And next week there's a presentation on uh, the the uh, new military global order. So if you're interested in that, check it out, geopoliticsinconflict.com. Follow me on Twitter at Alchemy of E and follow David on Twitter at, at DWellaloo. We love talking to you guys. We hope this was helpful. We'll be doing more of them. If you want us to do someone in particular or a particular speech or interviews, um, Put it in the comments below and we'll we'll do more of these. Anyway, thank you guys. And as always, stay informed. Till next time. Bye.